restorations replaced with uh, tooth colored restorations. And we also have a lot of patients who are coming in and saying, I don't want a silver filling. I want a composite restoration. So there is a lot of demand from the patient side in order to do composite dentistry. So with that in mind, let's look into how we can do predictable composite dentistry in day-to-day -day practice. And so first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Simon George, the president of IDA Tiruvalla, Dr. Thomas Sherian, who is here with us, Dr. Thomas Jacob, the honorary secretary, and Dr. Ravi Rajan, who is the CD representative uh, who made this uh, uh, possible. So uh, let's look, dwell into why composites. Why is composites becoming more and more common in day-to-day uh, -day practice? Uh, well, first of all, the tissue sparing principle. The minimal cavity prep with adhesive cavity rather than a conventional preparation. Now, this is one of the major differences between an amalgam preparation and a composite preparation is that in composites, you are expected to remove only the DK that is present. It is not necessary for an aggressive preparation wherein you have to prepare to give the retention form uh, that is required in amalgams. So it is a minimally invasive technique when we're using composites. Of course, the removal of caries is mandatory, but at the same time, we don't have to be over aggressive. Reinforcement of the residual tooth structure. So we know that composites are bonded restorations. So when you have a bonded restorations, you are reinforcing the tooth structure that is present. Aesthetics, of course, now more and more patients want invisible restorations. And amalgam phobia. Yes, a lot of media and uh, well, we also, the dental companies and everybody has created a hype regarding the toxicity, toxicity of amalgams. So which has led to its reduced usage. Improved materials. Now, unlike um, uh, the old composites, when they were first released, they were known to have constant failures and constant leakages. But the modern composites have an excellent physical and mechanical properties with a modulus of elasticity between 10 to 26 GPA, which is comparable that to dentine, as well as a wear behavior, which is similar to that of amalgam and enamel with in vivo abrasion of 10 to 50 microns per year. So that means that they are known to last for a long time now. The newer generation composites are known to last, they're not known to stay. So also they are now suitable for all types of restorations, class ones, class twos, class threes, you know, all the aesthetic restorations. So according to Skeeters and colleagues, 95% of restorations retain their function even after 15 years. So, but what are the, some of the disadvantages of composite restorations? Number one, there is need for good isolation. Uh, there is a lack of contrast between the tooth and the restoration interface. Uh, so we, we, if we need to remove the composite for whatever reason, it's sometimes difficult. It's difficult to uh, tell whether we are drilling on the composite or we are drilling on the tooth. So that is a lack of contrast between the tooth restoration interface. Recurrent caries is radiographically less visible and invariably requires more time to execute than amalgams. Yes, because of the added need for isolation, the added need to control the saliva flow onto the restoration interface. So yes, we take a little more time to do um, composites than to do amalgams. So today, I. The topics I wish to cover are class one lesions, class two, class three, class one, class five. These are the basic things that we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So along with that, the anesthesia protocols, as well as an introduction uh, regarding rubber dam, just the basic aspects of it so that we can isolate. Now, coming to class ones, I'll start off with class ones. And uh, I would like to keep this as uh, clinical as possible. And as I'm uh, going through that, we will discuss the theory aspects which are relating to the uh, uh, restorations. So let's start off with a small class one restoration. So as you can see, you have a restoration here with an old GIC restoration with some secondary decay that is happening. Now, one of the things, how do we know that it's going to be a filling usually? Usually the patient will come and say things like, it's sensitive to cold. There There is, a, there is a sensitivity from the dent and it stops immediately. If the pain or the sensitivity is lasting for something like 30 seconds and then only going, that's usually pulpitis, that's usually more advanced. But when it comes to fillings, usually it is the pain just comes and goes immediately because it is reversible uh, pulpitis. So it's coming from the dendy. So in this case, the patient had sensitivity to when chewing sweets. And uh, as you can see, there's an old GIC. When I entered the cavity, you can see the secondary decay that is present. 
Now, please know the texture of the DK. It has a soft tex texture to it uh, and uh, easily removed with a high speed burp. And as you can see now, a bulk of the caries has, but is that active caries? So how do we know that uh, this is active caries or it is, uh, uh, it is arrested or uh, there is a, a, a reparative dentine there? So don't be fooled by the color. Check with, your, uh, uh, check with your spoon excavator how hard it is. Now, what was the armamentarium that was used here? To remove bulk of the caries with a high-speed handpiece or a, and a medium round diamond burr. So you can remove bulk of the caries with that. Then shift to a slow speed burr and you have the appropriate size burr sizes of the slow speed uh, with a slow gentle motion. Now it's important to realize that even though it's a slow speed, uh, it generates adequate heat. So let's go with a gentle shaving motion on the uh, remaining caries that is on the floor of the uh, uh, cavity, helping to remove even further cavity, uh, I mean, in further decay. And last but not the least, use a sharp spoon excavator to check the consistency of the dentine and remove any further carious dentine that must be present on the floor of the uh, cavity. A sharp excavator will, uh, is really important. Uh, you can't use a dull excavator to uh, remove the carious dentine. So you will get a screeching sound. When you're, when you're removing with a sharp spoon excavator and you reach healthy dentine and healthy uh, tooth structure, you get a, it's a screeching sound. It's very clean. Uh, whereas when you're room uh, and the, one of the ways where you can uh, identify, take a high speed and remove enough, uh, uh, enough uh, tooth material to reach some healthy dentine and using the sharp spoon excavator, just scratch it on that healthy dentine and you will get a screeching sound and that screeching sound will usually tell you that I'm okay, I have removed adequate uh, uh, decay. It's very important that we do that. Next, chlorexidin. Uh, chlorexidin can be used to disinfect the cavity. Now we know that chlorexidin is used for other purposes as well, but chlorexidin is a very good disinfectant of the uh, cavity prep. Now reason is, you know, you still may have some bacteria which is present in the dentinal tubules uh, of your uh, cavity. Now we know that it can enter and the chlorexidin because of the property of substantiality, we know that it stays in the dendine for a long period of time. So you can place the chlorexidin there for a minute and this will help disinfect the cavity uh, further. Now in this case, I have done selective etching. Uh, so basically only the enamel is etched and the dendine is not etched. Now, how can we do this? So. Uh, let us have a small review of the etching protocols. Now, we know about there is a total etch protocol. Here, the etching of the enamel is done for 30 seconds and the etching of the dendine is done for 15 seconds. Now, what is the benefit of that? We know that when we do a cavity prep, there will always be some debris sitting on the enamel or, or in our enamel as well as the dendine. So when we do a total etch procedure, that is when we do 30 seconds of enamel etching and 15 seconds of dendine etching, what is going to happen is that there is going to be complete removal of the smear layer, which is the deposits that are there in the dendine, and you're going to have open tubules. So this will definitely give you a better uh, bonding onto the dendine. Now, uh, this is an important consideration that you should keep in mind. If you over etch the enamel, okay? If, so instead of the 30 seconds, as I, as I said here, I go back here, the total etch is you're etching enamel for 30 seconds, and etching dendine for 15 seconds. But if you over etch the enamel, that is you etch it for 45 seconds or 60 seconds, it neither increases the bond strength nor does it decrease the bond strength. As I can, as I'm showing here, it neither increases the bond strength nor does it decrease the bond strength. But if you over etch the dendine, that is you etch it for more than 15 seconds, what happens is that there is a loss of mineral surrounding the dendinal tubules leading to its collapse and it will result in an unstable hybrid layer, which will result in a lowered bond strength. So this is a clinically relevant point. Don't over etch your dendine. Uh, it will just call, cause the collapse of the dentinal tubules. And I, I, I have shown here the hybrid layer. I will, I will show a, a definitive image of the hybrid layer to help you uh, visualize that a little more. 
Now, the selective edge protocol. Now, this is basically used with self etching adhesives. Now, most of the adhesives that we are using now are self edge adhesives. So, we, uh, the, the whole idea is that the etchant, the primer, and the adhesive are all together present in one bottle. But even in this uh, self etching adhesives, you must etch the enamel for at least 15 seconds. So, we use here the enamel is etched for 15 seconds. And uh, with, oh, of course, 37% uh, phosphoric acid, the etchant is rinsed and dried. And then the self etch adhesive is applied and dabbed onto the cavity preparation with a micro brush for at least 20 seconds. Now, you need to keep dabbing this because now you have not etched the dendine. Whereas the self etch adhesive will etch the dendine, but you have to give it time. You don't just apply dry and cure immediately. It doesn't work. So if you have etched only the enamel and then you want the self etch adhesive to uh, etch the dendine, you need to dab it onto the dendine for at least 20 seconds. And in doing that, the self etch adhesive will etch the dendine as well as complete the etching of the enamel and you're going to get a good uh, bond strength. So the bottom line is that the etching protocol is dependent upon your bonding system you're using. So whatever bonding system you have, please take the pamphlet, read it up, and just follow the instructions that are given in that, and uh, you will be fine uh, regarding the adhesive protocol that you're following. Now, as you can see, this is the basic uh, review of the bonding agents. Uh, the fourth generation, there was an etchant separate, a primer separate, a resin separate, then you had the fifth and the sixth where you had the mixing etchant and the self priming resin and then the self etching primer where the etchant and the primer are in one bottle and the bonding resin is another. Now we have the single step, basically the 3M uh, universal bond, whereas the, the dense ply uh, prime and bond, these are all single step uh, adhesives where the etchant, the primer and the adhesives are present in one bottle itself and that's what we are using nowadays, most of us. After this, as you can see here, I have air dried the adhesive. Now, this is a very important step. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see that there is a thin layer of adhesive on the tooth structure. There is no pooling of the adhesive in any part of the restoration. There is only a thin layer of adhesive all over this uh, tooth. Now, why is that needed? Number one, all adhesives contain an alcohol solvent. If this alcohol solvent is not evaporated, it will affect the bonding. So by gently air thinning the adhesive after it has been dabbed, what it will do is that it will create a thin glossy surface on the tooth structure with no pooling of adhesive in any part of the restoration. And you should know that any excess adhesive in any part of the restoration will lead to a lower uh, uh, strength of the restoration in that area. So for example, if I did not air thin and I have adhesive sitting here, there is a bulk of adhesive sitting here. That bulk of adhesive will become a weakened portion of the adhesive uh, or weakened portion of the restoration. So a thin layer. And how much should you thin? The answer is until you can no longer see the adhesive moving on the restoration preparation. So gentle, low pressure air until you can no longer see the adhesive moving on the restoration preparation. Now, here I have started the incremental buildup for the tooth. I have a build up one segment here, and then I have built up the second segment here. And then last but not the least, I will build up this segment. Now, why do I go with the incremental buildup technique? We know that composites set by polymerization shrinkage. Every company, they can reduce the am amount of shrinkage through the various uh, modification in the chemical structure of the composite but they can never eliminate it because of the polymerization that takes place. There's always some shrinkage. So smaller the increment, lesser the shrinkage. The larger the increment, the more the shrinkage. So don't let your increment size exceed one to two mm. This makes things predictable. So uh, as it's, so, it's, it's very simple. We know that we have the bulk fills now. They say that even up to five mm, you can uh, make it in bulk and cure it in one go. Now, there might be studies that say that, yes, it's okay to uh, cure a five millimeter thick increment, but uh, let's, to be on the safer side, we know that the composite is going to shrink when it sets. So if it's going to shrink when it sets, it's always better to just take that extra one or two increments to build up the composite so that you get a uh, stable bond to the tooth, because if it shrinks, it's going to affect the bond, there could be leakage. 
So you can see that I have completed the build up here and then you do the basic finishing and polishing protocol and do the occlusal check. Now for posterior composites, uh, what do you need? You just need a very basic polishing kit. You will get these online or at your local store. It's a, it's a, the basic kit is sufficient. Here I have not tried to uh, do any uh, extraordinary finishing or anything. Coarse grit uh, green stone to do the basic uh, shaping of the restoration and uh, a white stone to do the, um, I think there's some music playing and um, okay, uh, there is uh, the white stone will help in the uh, finishing of the restoration, give it a polish as well. And that is sufficient, especially for posterior restorations. For anteriors, of course, you need more um, uh, more finishing and more polishing, but for posteriors, just a simple polishing kit will do the job. Now, coming to a large class one. Uh, now, here it is, will be slightly different. As you can see here, uh, you have a um, uh, lesion that has started. That is clearly there is uh, definitive caries entry into the tooth, and uh, you can see the extent of the caries here. Further removal of caries, and you can see that it is well into the dendy. Uh, and that is something that when you look at this, when you look at the first uh, photograph, you do not presume that within the within two, you know, 30 seconds, this would be the status. And after complete removal of the caries, this was the status of the restoration. You can see that there was a severe uh, uh, caries activity into the dendine, well along the dentino enamel junction and uh, very, very close to the pulp. So again, follow the same protocol, high speed, slow speed, and um, uh, move to your sharp spoon excavator. And as you can see, I corrected the isolation here because it was leaking. Um, now, why does this happen? Uh, so it's important that we understand the pathophysiology of pit and fissure caries. Now, in a pit and fissure caries, this was given by Valentini in 1992. The, the decay starts from the pit and fissure crosses the enamel and once it reaches the dentine, it spreads laterally and in all directions. So the DK, what you see from the top is not what you see on the inside. So Valentini uh, gave this diagram and uh, it shows the caries progress in a class one. It moves well into the, uh, well into the dentino enamel junction and then it progresses uh, downward in all directions. So Again, such a deep cavity with so much carious activity, uh, chlorex didn't to disinfect. And uh, this is a question that may come to mind. Does chlorex affect the bond of composite to the tooth structure? And the answer is no. The chlorex does not affect the bond to the tooth structure, but don't use chlorex with fluoride combinations. Use pure chlorex combinations. Don't mix chlorex and fluoride because fluoride is known to uh, Um, affect the bond. So don't use fluoride. Now, this is not mandatory. You don't have to. You can directly bond to dentine even in deep caries, but uh, I prefer to keep a GIC lining uh, because just to prevent uh, uh, further insult to the pulp. Here I've used a total edge, uh, no issues, but don't over edge the dentine. So uh, just to give you an idea, even if you're using self edge adhesives, uh, you can etch the dentine, but don't over etch it. So etch it for like five, five to 10 seconds, that's sufficient. And uh, uh, then go ahead with the uh, uh, self etch adhesive and complete the restoration. Again, you have a thin glossy layer of adhesive after air thinning. You can see that there is no pooling of the adhesive in any part of the restoration. So that means there is no weak part of the restoration. Uh, and you have also dissolved the uh, alcohol content in the adhesive. Now, the incremental pattern for a large DK is different from uh, the incremental pattern for a small DK. Uh, the reason behind this is if you look at the total distance between, uh, let's go back here. Yeah, and this is a large distance of the composite in this area, what is going to happen is that there is going to be a shrinkage between the buccal and the lingual aspect of the restoration, which will essentially lead to a high polymerization shrinkage. So it can lead to stresses within the tooth 
and also it can lead to a weakened bond between the surfaces so in a large cavity the incremental pattern is different i have gone for an oblique layering pattern you can see the red increment 2 3 4 5 6 6 yes it takes time and we uh, go with the oblique layering protocol so that uh, each increment does not fight with the width of the cavity in a, when it's shrinking so you first place this one the first increment cure it place the second increment cure it and go by that that protocol so so that you minimize the polymerization shrinkage and uh, the stress so as you can see horizontal versus oblique layering which one and when a horizontal layering you are packing the first increment the second increment and the third increment in oblique layering you are always going by uh, what what i showed uh, in the previous slide so in small diameter cavities that is up to half the intercuspal distance horizontal layerings are all right but in large diameter cavities it is better to go with the oblique layering now Uh, coming again uh, to something called a c factor a c factor is the ratio of the bonded to the unbonded restoration surfaces that has a profound impact on the polymerization shrinkage stress the greater the c factor the greater the shrinkage stress now you would think that the class 1 would be the simplest cavity to do in terms of avoiding shrinkage it's just the opposite a class 1 has a bonded surface of 5 there is an unbonded surface of just one so when you take the ratio the c factor is 5 so let's let's just have a look the bonded surfaces of a class 1 are basically the flow the floor the buccal the lingual the mesial and the distal aspects of the cavity now what happens if you uh, cure everything in one go if you pack it like uh, in one increment now you have five surfaces fighting for the bonding and when you have five surfaces fighting for the bonding you have a lot of stress created within the tooth structure that can lead to micro stresses and micro shrinkage in the tooth which will essentially lead to the restoration uh, margin failing after a while in a class 2 m uh, meso occlusal or occlusal, uh, occlusal distal you have uh, the c factor is 2 in a class 2 mod it's actually just one the bonded surfaces are three the unbonded surfaces are three so this uh little uh table will really help us understand that in a class 1 which we think would be the simplest restoration to just build up and you would feel let me just build it up in one go it has a highest c factor so it has a highest possibility of shrinkage stresses within the tooth so it's really important that we go for an incremental build up in a class 1 uh and this is basically the build up and uh i have to polish it a little more as you can see but the completed restoration you can say now coming to class 2s so uh, i'll let's start off with a very simple class 2 and i would like to introduce a concept here uh, which is very simple uh, but it's useful for all class 2s because uh, of uh, the technique that was described uh, okay so you have a simple class 2 that is starting here uh, an old amalgam restoration i've done a simple isolation now in class 2s the isolation protocol is very simple but uh, the clamp should be ideally on one tooth behind and one tooth ahead of it also should be isolated so you have enough space to uh, keep your uh, uh, matrixing so if you isolate like for example in the class 1 i isolated just the tooth that was being treated if i do that for in a class 2 the problem is i won't have place to keep the matrix so ideally it should be one tooth behind and one tooth ahead also uh, is better to be isolated now as you can see here uh, i have removed the caries i have removed the old amalgam restoration i have done a basic uh, uh, tofelmeyer uh, matrixing and a gic lining now coming to okay the etching and the adhesive application now in a class 2 again you have to be very careful regarding the adhesive now why we have to be careful in a class 2 with an adhesive is because invariably this area we don't dry much we don't we don't allow the air to reach there enough we will just uh, air dry this area and we we'll leave this area now what happens when you leave this area this area will get pulled up with the adhesive now remember this is the cervical margin this is the area where there is a maximum amount of bacteria 
and this is one of the weakest areas in the restoration so if this area you have a pooling of adhesive now remember that adhesive is adhesives don't contain fillers your packable composites your flowable composites they all contain fillers which make them strong whereas an adhesive has no fillers so if an adhesive is pooled in this area you're going to have a weakened cervical margin and so it's very important added air pressure there to ensure that no adhesive pools in this area of the restoration okay now coming to something called the snow plow technique after you cure the adhesive what you need to do is that place some flowable composite in this cervical margin and don't cure it don't cure the flowable composite that you placed here then take an increment of packable composites your 3m z50s uh, or your ivoclar tetric and ceramics whatever it is the packable composites take an increment and pack it here what happens a bulk of the flowable will come to the top and you pack the incre your increment you pack it down and a bulk of this flowable composite will come to the top and when it comes to the top remove it remove as much of the flowable composite that comes to the top as possible now what is the benefit of it you will end up with a restoration that has no voids whatsoever in the margin because this again is a critical area of the tooth so for example if i did not do this if i did not place flowable and i just start packing the uh, if i start packing the packable composite right into the cervical margins what happens if this there is a void there what happens if there is a void in this area of the restoration invariably you're going to have caries there you're going to have secondary decay there so that's something you don't want so the best way to avoid voids happening in a class 2 proximal box is place some flowable add some packable remove the excess flowable that comes because flowables have uh, more polymerization shrinkage so you don't want that so remove the excess flowable that comes on the top and then cure it come followed by uh, packing of the uh, uh, restoration and curing it incrementally and as you can appreciate here it is a completely void free restorative margin and so that's something that we can be happy about uh, my basic composite instruments of packing just two instruments from walden there are so many expensive instruments available you can purchase them if that's what you what you want to have no issues but I, all, all i'm saying is that for your basic composite packing you just need two basic instruments uh this one uh, has a flat ended tip here as well as a packing tip here and this one which is more for anteriors has a flat ended tip as well as a the flat ended turn 90 degrees so it really helps in shaping the anterior restorations whereas this one is very nice for packing your composites uh in the posterior so this is just what i use just two simple instruments and that gets the job done a uh, snow plow technique as i as i already described um now coming to caries removal in a class 2 so uh, here we have a dk uh, that has started on the proximal the mesial surface of the first molar and as you can see there is nothing on the occlusal surface so um, you know I, i i i always say that we should look into the dk with high illumination very good illumination and dry the tooth as well as a nice a uh, reflective uh, mirror preferably a rhodium coated mirror uh, a rhodium coated mirror will always give you a very nice view of the caries dry the tooth and look at under isolation and uh, you will be able to identify them uh, this dk was identified and uh, did a basic isolation now i just want to say this isolation is not ideal as you can see the clamp is on the tooth that i am treating it actually makes my life harder this clamp should be on the tooth that should be on tooth number 7 so this is not an ideal isolation that i did initially now uh, as i enter you can see the you can appreciate the uh, softened dentine that is present as well as the demineralized enamel further entry into the tooth you can see it more you can see the chalky white enamel that is present now that's demineralized enamel it needs to be removed because the bonding of composite to demineralized enamel is never very good uh and uh you can again see there is definite caries along the dj uh and into the dentine okay again i have removed some more and one of the things i like to do when i'm uh doing a class 2 uh caries removal uh a toffelmeyer cut it and just placed it interproximally 
here you can see the demineralized enamel is still present and you can see caries along the dej so there is still there is still uh, dk to be removed here uh, and finally uh, let's have a review of the difference between a class 1 uh, caries activity and a class 2 caries activity so in a class 2 caries activity the surface demineralization happens first remember that it's not a pit it's a surface so the cone is upside down in a class 1 the cone would be on top the cone tip would be on top and the base would be at the bottom whereas in a class 2 caries the the base is at the surface and the tip is at the dentino enamel junction and when it reaches the dentino enamel junction again it spreads via the dentino enamel junction both mesially and distally and it again progresses so the dk is usually much bigger than what we presume it to be so here again you can see the, the so demineralized enamel the uh, dk that is going along the uh, dentino enamel junction and this is the final completed caries removal as you can see uh, very clean enamel and a clean dej and uh, the dk has been removed uh, so here i have a place a toffelmeyer and uh, uh, got a clean margin acquisition you can see that the margin is clearly acquired now in a class 2 this word that is margin acquisition is a very very important term because if we can't acquire the margins with a matrix that means that we will not be able to get the emergence profile that we need ideally from the tooth we will end up with an overhang and if we have an overhang in a class 2 we are going to end up having gingival inflammation so the word margin acquisition in a class 2 is very important now in this case because the margin of the restoration is about the gingiva it is not uh, it is not equi gingival or sub gingival the margin acquisition is easy and when the margin acquisition is easy it's it's simple to get a clean dry field without blood or gcf in this situation so we know in deep cavities that is going to be a challenge now with amalgams whether you have blood or little gcf in the margin is not much of a problem all you need to do is pack the amalgam the amalgam itself will displace the blood and the gcf and you're going to get a fine restoration but in composites if you have blood and gcf in this cervical margin your restoration is going to fail because we know that blood and gcf significantly affect the bonding of composites resins to the tooth structure so when the margin is adequately supra gingival it's easy to acquire that is it's easy to get a clean uh, margin free of blood and uh, saliva a wooden wedge is placed that allows uh, adequate separation between the tooth so that once the uh, packing is done and we remove the wedge the contact between the two teeth is good we know that we have to compensate for the thickness of the band that is used so the wooden wedge helps in adequate separation of the two teeth and uh, helps to get a good contact between the molar and the premolar and in this case i have achieved a good contact between the molar and the premolar i could have shaped this a bit better but uh, overall i am happy i use a snow plow technique here uh, again place some flowable composite don't cure it add an increment of composite remove the excess of the flowable composite and then cure it and build it up in increments even though this was a small cavity i used two increments to build it up again the smaller the increment lesser the shrinkage uh, uh, so that gives us a more predictable restoration with less stress built into it okay now what is the class 2 general protocol i i showed you a, a, a two two uh, uh, fillings with a toffel mat now i will show you with a sectional matrix so as you can see here uh, it's an uh, definite demineralization across uh, uh, around the me mesial aspect of the first molar and uh, i initiate caries removal as you can see again demineralized enamel the dk reaches the dentine and once it reaches the dentino enamel junction it spreads again mesially and distally you can see it clearly once all the dk is removed as you can see clean uh, 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 you know that's that's clean enamel uh, a clean dentino enamel junction and the dentine is healthy here uh, also i have done a beveling of the uh, margins now in this matrix and protocol uh, i have used a toffelmeyer retainer uh, sorry not a toffelmeyer an ivory matrix and i really like ivory matrixes because they are very strong so uh, it's if sometimes a contact can be really hard 
And uh, if you try to place a thin sectional matrix, it, it can just uh, fold uh, in pieces. So an ivory really helps to uh, um, you know, and enter even a tough contact. And one of the benefits is that it holds its shape very well. It gives a very nice shape to it. So I've used a dense ply uh, clamp uh, and there's a wooden wedge here, although it, it's not shown, there is a wooden wedge to create separation. Now, I spoke to you about the hybrid layer before. Uh, so once the adhesive is placed and you air thin it and you can see a nice thin glossy layer of the adhesive here also, it's good practice to dab the adhesive onto the dentine for around 20 seconds. Not only does it help in the etching protocol, it also helps the form. Formation of the hybrid layer. Now, what is the hybrid layer? The hydration and the dentine, where the adhesive enters into the dentinal tubules of the uh, uh, tooth, as well as the pericubular dentine. So, in this microscope, electron microscope photograph that you're looking at, you can see that the C, which is the composite, the A, which is the adhesive, and the H, which is the hybrid layer, essentially the adhesive enters into the dentinal tubules which have been etched. And this this area is called as a hybrid layer. So when you have a strong hybrid layer, you have better dentine bonding. So it's a good practice with your micro tip. Once you place the adhesive onto the dentine, dab it for 20 seconds. Just dab it for 20 seconds and it allows for a better formation of the hybrid layer. Now the uh, restoration is completed. And as you can see, the X-ray uh, clean emergence profile is needed. Uh, which will help in, uh, you know, maintaining a healthy uh, uh, periodontal uh, status of, for the tooth. Also, uh, one good practice is just to take a sickle scaler or a, a probe and just run it around the tooth, uh, around the gingiva after you're finished, because sometimes the adhesive flows into the subgingival areas. And uh, once we cure it there, it can be a little irritating to the gingiva. So it's a good practice after the filling is over, just take a a probe or a sickle scaler and just run it around the uh, gingiva to make sure that there is no adhesive sitting uh, anywhere. Now coming to a deep margin elevation, basically what are we, what are we doing now in cases where subgingival I think the connection got cut.
our speaker will be joining back. Unfortunately, his net connection got cut. Wait for a few minutes. Okay. Doctor, we can see you. Doctor Matthew, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah, now we can hear you. You you can hear me. Yeah, now we can yeah. hear you. Um, can you? Uh, doctor, I'm trying to share the screen, but uh, just please, I I apologize. I don't know why this is uh, uh, happening like this. Yeah, it's okay. It's now your co-host. Your connection got cut. That's okay. Just yeah. Screen share it now. Um, are you on a phone or a laptop phone yeah i'm 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 trying to shift to my phone because the laptop doesn't seem to be the laptop is not working and i'm trying to shift to a phone okay um Just give me a minute. Uh, I yeah. think I can I can do it from my phone once again. Yeah, no problem. I'm trying to connect to the Zoom. Um,
Okay. Um, I have this rejoin. I have this rejoin. Why is this coming like this? Uh, hello? Uh, hello? Dr. Sainz, we can hear you. Can you can you make uh, uh, myself the the thing uh, that is Matthew Sunny? Can you make me the host? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Yeah, uh, Matthews. Doctor Matthew Sunny? No, Matthew. Oh, okay. this Matthew Sunny. Yeah. Okay, I've done it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, share. Can you see me? Yeah. No. Can, can, can the screen see? Yeah. Okay. Um, just, once again, I, I apologize to everyone for that inconvenience. Okay, so I will start off here where we left off. Okay, so coming to deep margin elevation, Coming to deep margin elevation. So it is really important that in a class two, uh, we are able to elevate the margins. Um, am, I, am I audible to everybody? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah, yeah okay. So, wh so what is the problem with uh, the deep margin? As you can see in class two, a margin that is very close to the gums, when we get there with the burr, it's going to start bleeding uh, badly. And when it starts bleeding badly, uh, you know, our margins are going to get contaminated. So there's some way we need to find to arrest the bleeding that is uh, present in a deep margin. For that, how do we control bleeding? Now, ideally you need lasers and electrocautery, which is an excellent tool to uh, control the bleeding. But unfortunately, uh, I don't have it. And I know that uh, many people don't have lasers and electrocautery. So what would be the protocol? Now let's uh, examine a case with uh, a deep plus two. Uh, as you can see, there's an old amalgam with secondary decay. I removed it. The class two is clearly seen. Now, here we go. Here we have a heavy dam in place. You can see clearly that it's a very deep margin and deep in general, and in this case, it was bleeding badly. So you have a heavy dam in place, and what does it do? It displaces the gingiva downward. Also, a thick layer of Teflon is packed into the sulcus. 
what is the benefit of packing a thick layer of Teflon into the surface? It basically inverts the dam and adds another layer of material preventing blood from seeping through. As you can see, this is a close up view of this uh, situation. You can see the rubber dam in place as well as a um, uh, Teflon pack into the uh, margin. So this is allowed for, um, uh, this is allowed for, uh, sorry, uh, this is allowed for the margin to be acquired very cleanly. Now, uh, coming to dam inversion. So why, 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 does, why do we need to do a dam inversion? The dam inversion is done because if the dam is sitting straight up, okay, if the dam is sitting straight up, um, uh, you can, the saliva and the blood will flow through it easily. So when you have the dam that is inverted, now the, it protects the uh, saliva and uh, the blood from uh, seeping through. Uh, can I just confirm with everyone that you are seeing a textbook photograph here? Hello? Actually, the it's a small photograph. Uh, it's, on a, it's from a phone, right? That's why I think. A bit small. Yeah. Um, How do you... Right. Am, I, am I on the slide that says wide arm inversion? No, no, no. What is the problem with deep margins? I'm still on that slide. Uh, yeah. Uh, I will, I think I will have to just go uh, slide by slide. That's what's working. So I'll, I'll, I, I hope I, I am sorry. It's just not, uh, you know, coming the way we want to do it. No, we can see it actually right now. It's a bit small. That's all. Okay, fine. So I'll continue with that. Okay. So uh, as you can see, you have a class two, large amalgam class two with uh, secondary decay there. And uh, as once I've removed the uh, decay, you see a heavy dam in place. And so what is the benefit of the heavy dam? It displaces the gingiva downward. And also I have packed a Teflon into that margin. What is the benefit of that? It inverts the dam. And it also adds another layer of material preventing blood from seeping through that area. Have a look at the closer view of this, uh, uh, um, this situation right now. The margin is being acquired by using a Teflon pack through that uh, uh, sulcus that has resulted in the margin being acquired. Now we ask ourselves, why do we need dam inversion? Why does the dam have to be inverted? Now, if we can see in this first image, if the dam thing goes, what happens that blood and saliva easily pass through that area? Whereas the moment the dam is inverted, that is facing uh, gingivally, now when the blood and saliva come there, it stops itself. So this is why dam inversion is needed in a situation where we are doing a deep class two. Then I have placed an ivory matrix on top of that. So now what is the benefit of using an ivory matrix? As I said, it's a very strong matrix. So it's easy to acquire the margins and it also pushes the Teflon and the rubber dam downwards. It pushes the rubber dam and the Teflon pack downward and acquires the margin at the same time. Have a look at this closer view of the uh, margin. As you can see, the ivory has acquired the margin very clearly and there is no blood uh, or saliva or GCF in this area. So this is essentially what uh, DME is. It's, it's deep margin elevation. Matthew, sir. Uh, yeah? Sir, uh, actually there's an option for slideshow. Slideshow, yeah, phone. You can click on that slideshow. Our video will be on the mail. Share. That's it. Click on it. ാണ് <laughs> 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 The, uh, the ivory matrix is placed, it has quickly displaced the rubber dam as well as the Teflon pack and you have a clean margin. And I have completed the restoration. 
So now that we have discussed this uh, Paladin matrixing system and everything that you're seeing, let us have a look at, have a basic understanding of the Paladin system because it is something that we use on a uh, regular basis. You see it on Facebook and everything. It is, it is very here, very common. So basically you have multiple sizes of the matrix band that is available, 3.5 mm height, 4.5 mm height, 5.5 mm and 6.5, based on what you want to use it for, whether you want to use it for periodontics, a medium sized premolar or a class two in a molar or a large uh, molar. It also comes with the forceps where you can uh, you know, hold the clamp and place it. It comes with multiple size wedges. You have a dark blue, which is a very thin wedge meant for interproximal areas, which are very thin. Like for example, in the anteriors, you have a medium dark, which is uh, meant for like between premolars where the interproximal space is, um, uh, you know, not uh, very large. And also you have the light blue, which is very large, and that is meant for large interproximal spaces. Uh, so what is the benefit of using these wedges? Uh, because they are flexible, because these uh, wedges are flexible, uh, they will adapt very nicely to the uh, um, tooth structure horizontally. And they have one more benefit, they apically displace the gingiva. Now this is very important. In a deep margin, when we place a, a paladin matrix into the interproximal area, it apically displaces the gingiva so that uh, uh, the gums are away from the margin. And it horizontally displaces the matrix onto the tooth structure. So as you can see here, uh, coming back to the isolation, if you look carefully, I have placed that light blue wedge between the teeth. So adapt the matrix band onto the cervical margin also. So very beneficial. And you have, um, okay, now let's uh, look at another technique of DME. So I, I, I showed you one technique of DME here. Another technique of DME that uses a palerin or there are other uh, brands like Garrison. Uh, so here we have a cavity. Uh, the cavity prep is initiated. And have a look at this. Here I have placed no matrix whatsoever initially. All I have done is place the largest wedge that goes into this interproximal area. Now, what is the benefit of this wedge? As I said, one, it apically displaces the gingiva. Secondly, the walls of the wedge, the walls of the wedge can be used to uh, uh, build up some composite there so that the margin is elevated. So what you need to do is that etch prime and bond the, the cavity preparation that you have done and place a little flowable into the either aspect of your um, um, wedge. So essentially what it does, it lifts up the margin above the epigingival or the subgingival area. And now, once you have done that, you can place your normal conventional matrix and uh, a band and protocol. So what was once a uh, uh, equigingival or a deep margin now became a supragingival margin with the use of a palodent uh, wedge, which has an adequate enough height and it apically displaces and creates a horizontal seal such that you can just end it such that it lifts up the margin around one mm above the previous margin position. Then we just follow the normal protocol of placing the matrix band and uh, building up the restoration as you can see here. Now, one last method of class two margin acquisition is with a Toffelmeyer matrix. Now a Toffelmeyer matrix uh, is very beneficial because of the simple fact that it can form a tight wrap. As you know that we can tighten the Toffelmeyer matrix adequately. And in tightening the Toffelmeyer matrix adequately, you will get a, um, a good seal between the margin and the uh, tooth. Use that along with a wedge and you can again acquire the margins very cleanly. Um, there is some confusion in here. Okay, let us go back to now the class threes. Now let's start with simple class threes. As you can see, this is a patient who uh, wanted to get his uh, uh, discoloration and caries activity between his teeth sorted out. Uh, you can see that I have initially entered the uh, restoration, I mean, sorry, entered the cavity prep. And uh, again, there is uh, enamel mineralization, dentine is caries. You can see the complete removal of the uh, decay. I have placed a metal matrix and a wooden wedge. Now it's important that we remember that a class three 
is nothing but a class two in an anterior. That's all it is. A class three is nothing but a class two in an anterior. So the same protocol of placing a wedge is really important because if we if we don't do that, we will not get the ideal adaptation of the class three to the two. So very important that we combine the uh, metal matrix along the wooden wedge to get a nice adaptive structure. Now, if you see, I have built up the um, I have built up the uh, tooth structure and uh, there is some excess. I'm sorry, it's so small, but I hope you can appreciate that there is some excess tooth material. I mean, composite material that is uh, done in the filling here and that needs to be addressed. And the best way to do that is to use DP blades. Number 12 or number 15, it's very handy. You can just scrape it and um, uh, it gives an excellent uh, finish to the uh, restoration. Um, then start off with the adjacent tooth, uh, remove the DK. And again, in, now I have placed a um, mylar strip. So why is it that initially I placed a metal strip here and here I went for a mylar strip. The answer is that initially the contact between the two teeth was a little tight. So uh, in such situation, when there is a very tight contact, it's beneficial to use a metal strip. It can just, it can just go in very easily. Basically, it's nothing but a tophelmire retainer that I've cut, I mean, sorry, tophelmire matrix that I've cut and placed it. So in doing so, it uh, easily uh, places into the interproximal area. Then by that time, the wedge is in place, so the contact is loose, and I was able to place a my last strip and the completed restorations. So uh, again, now you can see that a little excess that was present in the first filling is removed. I've done that with a, a BP blade. And why is that? Because if you look, uh, normally we go with the polishing uh, with uh, yellow band birds. So the yellow band burrs uh, is great for gross finishing and uh, smoothening of the restoration. But if we try to use these yellow band burrs in the interproximal areas, uh, it's a little tricky because you may end up creating a ditch because of a high speed, when you place a aerotor handpiece into the interproximal area, you may end up creating a ditch in your restoration or on the tooth structure, which is something you don't want. So, um, um, this way. So uh, if you look back again uh, in this, uh, the, when the first filling is done, you can see there's a little excess. That kind of excess is best to be uh, removed with a BP blade. Number 15 BP blade or a number 10, 12 BP blade will do the job. Now polishing is obviously important. So let us uh, use a yellow band polishing followed by soft, soft play disc polishing. Uh, the soft light disc polishing is ideally combined with a diadem, uh, I mean, with a diamond polishing paste. And you can see that you have these uh, various uh, coarse, medium, fine, and super fine. The black coarse ones actually literally shape, uh, shape the filling. So uh, be careful when you're using the coarse one. The fine and the super fine, uh, they will just help in polishing your restoration. So especially with anteriors, it's important that we have a nice polish. If otherwise, within two to three weeks, uh, the composite will discolor. And if you have a margin which is not smooth, then it will definitely discolor the uh, uh, tooth. So it's important that we get a nice finish when it comes to anterior class threes and class twos. Now, coming to a large class three, as you can see, the patient presented to me with, uh, with a class three already present. There's already uh, some secondary decay happening there. This is the palatal view of the restoration. Now, have a look after caries removal and the matrixing protocol. So in this case, I would like you to um, just appreciate the matrixing protocol. That is the metal matrix is placed, a wooden wedge is placed to adapt the cervical margin cleanly. And if you look on the top aspect of the restoration or the incisal aspect of the matrixing, I have used some flowable composite there that stabilizes the matrix there cleanly. Now, why is that needed? Because every time you're etching, bonding and, um, uh, you know, air drying and things like that, if there is a chance that the matrix can displace itself. So it's always good if you use some flowable composite and just stabilize the restoration there. This is the anterior view. You can again, the flow composite that stabilizes the tooth and um, uh, you can see that the wedge adapts the matrix nicely. Now, it is my uh, suggestion that it's a good, uh, good uh, practice to use some high strength flowables in this situation. The reason is when you use packables to pack this area up, uh, again, there's always a chance that 
there is the matrix can displace itself a little bit. So the first layer, I would recommend the use of a flowable composite, uh, a high strength flowable like GC, Genial, or from Shofu, whichever is suits you. And place it there, and what you get is a nice, um, uh, you know, the, the packing or the buildup part of it is very simple. Again, do it in increments so that you can uh, complete it fast. And as you can see, there's a good shade match here, and uh, I'm happy with the restoration. Here you have another class three that is uh, shown. You have, uh, um, you say, uh, infinite case activity, thorough removal of the caries. As you can see, if you look carefully, you can see a pinkish hue in the middle of that cavity prep. And the pinkish hue is essentially, you know, very close to the pulp. So I've given a GIC lining. I have uh, used a uh, Toffelmeyer matrix and I have built it up. Now, coming to class fours. Now, the the main thing that we need to remember in a class four is that we want to have adequate uh, tooth structure for bonding. So in order to achieve adequate tooth structure for bonding, uh, you, it's good to have a bevel. As you can see, I've shown you some uh, green markings there on the tooth. The green marking is probably a, is an area where around one mm, one and a half mm, you can use a red band burr uh, to just create a bevel on the tooth, tooth surface. And this will have the increased area of bonding onto enamel. Remember, bonding to enamel is always better than bonding to dentine. So it's always good if you just uh, use that. Build it up quickly. Um, and uh, here you have a good uh, shade match. Now, uh, there are many techniques for class four, but I would like to focus on two critical areas of class four, uh, this thing. And uh, that is correct shade and correct occlusion. Because these are the two critical areas for success in a... Uh, class four restoration. So let us have a look at shade. Now shade, we know that the basic shade is combined of a hue, which is the basic color, which is either yellow, orange, red, or green. That is nothing but the shade. Then you have the um, um, the value. Now value is nothing but the brightness or the darkness of an image. So the brighter the image, higher the value, darker the image, lower the value. Now, any image can be converted into a grayscale. So, for example, you know, any old movie, any photograph, the color can be converted into a grayscale. Now, what is important to uh, understand is that uh, uh, the eye is very sensitive to changes in value. The eye is very changes in sensitive to value for the simple reason that the eye is made up of two types of cells, the rod cells and the cone cells. Now, the cones, which are the responsible for color, is much less than the rods, which are responsible for identifying black and white. So your eye is very sensitive to value of a tooth more than the color of a tooth. Now, uh, uh, let's have a look at chroma. What is chroma? Chroma is nothing but the degree of saturation of a particular color. Now, any uh, chroma can again be converted into a value-based image by simply putting the black and white filter. So in our phones and in our computers, we all have the black and white filter we can convert it very easily into a um, uh, black and white image and analyze it. So as I said, why is value so important? Because our retina contains more uh, rod cells and cone cells. So there are uh, 120 million uh, rod cells, where are there are only six to seven million uh, colors, color sensitivity cells, which are the cones. So how is that directly applied into our day-to-day -day practice? Now we know about the button technique. What is the button technique? You take some composite and you're trying to select the shade for an anterior tool. You take some composite and you take little buttons, say A1, A2, and A3. You take a little of it, place it onto the tooth and cure it. And when you cure it, you will be able to identify uh, whether the shade is correct or not. And how do you confirm this? What you need to do is simply convert it into a black and white image. Simply put the black and white filter on your phone or on your uh, uh, software. And you will be able to identify the relationship of the value of the composite. And that is of more importance than the color as such. So whether you're using A1, A2, and A3, more the chroma, that is A3 shade of composite, will be uh, darker than A1. So any difference in the darkness of the tooth or the lightness of the tooth will easily be identified by a, a second person. So what you need to do is that once you do the button technique, that is place, say, uh, three buttons of A1, A2, and A3 on the tooth surface, convert it into a black and white image on your phone, on your computer, and this will help you to 
uh, identify whether you have chosen the right shade or not. Because remember, a change in value is more sensitive to the eye than a change in color. Now, as you can see, this is the 3M Filtech uh, shade range. They have combined it with the Vita Classical shade. And as you can see, the A1 corresponds to both A1, D1, and D2 in Vita Classical. A2 corresponds to A2 and D4. A3 corresponds to A3 and B3. And A3.5 corresponds to A3.5 and B4 in the Vita Classical. Simply convert it into the value image, and you can see why it's okay to use A1 for three different shades. B2 for A2 for two different shades, A3 for another two, and A3.5 for another two shades. Because the value is of more importance than the chroma. So keep that in mind. Now, this is another class four that uh, I'm showing. As you can see, in the first photograph, the black and white image, you can see the dentine is definitely darker because it's a huge fracture. The dentine is exposed and there is a definite, you can see the difference in the value of the peak. Whereas, as you come, as I've completed this restoration, you can see the value between the two teeth is the same. You can see a, a very good match. So when you get the value right, you get the shade right. Think about it that way, especially with composites, because we are not trying to play with multiple shades. Uh, just simple day-to-day -day basics: A1, A2, A3, and A3.5. Uh, if you get the value right, your shade will be good. Now coming to the occlusion, because when we do a uh, class four, what is so important is that the, the filling doesn't break off. And uh, if you look at this image of the palatal surface of a central incisor, you can see a definite concavity to the tooth. Now, the concavity of the tooth is very important on the palatal surface. We cannot make the palatal surface convex when we uh, do the restoration, because if we do, it will result in a definite fracture of the tooth. So uh, let us have a look at how we chew. As you can see, these markings that are shown in this image, nothing but anterior regions that are checked with the articulating paper. Now you can see that there is equal intensity of the markings on both the central incisors. This is very important, the equal intensity of the markings on both the central incisors. Now, I have given a, um, what is it, a, an image where what will happen if the marking on one tooth that we get when we check with the articulating paper is thicker than the, or darker than the other tooth. What that means is if this black line, just I'm just corresponding it to a class four restoration. If this gives a higher, um, uh, darker marking, it is sure to fracture. So it is very important. What we want is that when we finally check the occlusion, it should be of equal intensity on both the central incisors and uh, uh, the shape of the restoration should definitely be con concave on the palatal surface as shown by the enveloper function also so that the chewing is also in an ideal way. Never make it convex because it will definitely fracture. Coming to class fives. So now the most important thing in a class five is usually they're very close to the gingiva. So to uh, get the margin, it's very simple. Just use a retraction cord. Just use any retraction cord that you have, double zero, just pack it in and acquire the margins. As you can see in this case, I have a, you have a definite decay. The gums are sitting over the uh, decay. And all I've done, I've not done any gingivitimia or anything like that. I have uh, packed in uh, uh, the retraction cord and this has uh, exposed the margins cleanly. I have completed the filling. And the blood that you're seeing in the lower third image that you're seeing is nothing but I've taken a sickle scaler and just ensured that I've removed all the subgingival adhesive that is there because any adhesive in the subgingival margin will be causing inflammation. So just clean it up and uh, uh, you will get your filling. Now in this case, it's actually, uh, you can say it's not a great case, but as I, as I just shared about shade, when I check in the value scale, I got the shade a little wrong. If you look carefully, the class five restoration is of a lighter shade than the tooth itself. So in this case, I got the shade wrong because I got the value of the tooth wrong. Uh, the shade was, one shade darker actually. Uh, I could have used one shade darker composite rather than what I've used. And it is clearly seen by the value image of this tooth. Again, now coming to abrasion defects. Uh, abrasion defects are very common, especially when people brush very hard. Uh, the uh, hard brush, people who brush with a hard bristle and those who have heavy occlusal forces tend to have abrasion defects. Now, as you can see, I have again acquired the margins with def, uh, a retraction cord. 
this is an important step because otherwise your margin will literally be equidistinguishable so the main thing that we need to remember in a class 5 is that acquire the margin with a retraction curve uh, and one suggestion that i have is that the first increment of building up the composite let it be with flowable composite a 0.5 mm thickness of flowable composite to build up a class 5 is very good the reason is when we try to build up a class 5 with packable composite it usually just uh lifts up back from the tube so um uh, the reason for this is because there's nothing to hold it it's an open it's an open cavity so when you try to pack it it usually just lifts back up so my suggestion is after you do the etching the priming and the first layer of composite let it be a flowable composite 0.5 mm thickness and then when you pack or uh, try to uh, shape the packable composite over the remaining over flowable composite it sticks a lot better so that is my suggestion coming to the anesthesia protocols now nobody likes it but it's not optional um, you know make it as painless as possible use a, a gel or an anesthetic spray wait for at least 30 seconds to 1 minute infiltrations are enough uh, for the maxilla you may need a greater palatine and an isopalatine block whenever necessary especially um, um, if you're placing a rubber dam in the mandible uh, for premolars or anteriors a mental nerve block is sufficient uh, lingual infiltrations also and only for the molars only for the molars um, uh, you need to um, give um, a f block and uh, the uh, yeah so sometimes you may need a second one as well but uh, uh, just make things as comfortable as possible surface anesthesia followed by submucosal infiltrations and then a full block and the basic rubber dam protocol i'm showing for the class 2 uh, as you can see the tooth behind the tooth to be uh, uh, prepped should be place the rubber dam the clamp the tooth uh, that is being treated and one tooth in front also and uh, you can also utilize a um, contralateral clamp that will help in the uh, uh, the stability of the uh, restoration uh one second if you don't mind i'm just going to stop the screen share my one second please Hello, doctor. Can you hear us? You're on mute, doctor. You're on mute. Um, yeah. So, um, like I said, I I had actually a lot more slides prepared. Uh, this was just a copy that was on my uh, phone, and uh, I had a lot more to share. Unfortunately, my laptop. I don't know why it is not uh, connecting. Uh, unfortunately, and. Um, Uh, i actually had a lot more to share <laughs> uh it's uh, it's sad that uh, i'm unable to share it actually uh, so uh, i had at least uh, 20 to 30 slides more uh, that i could share uh, this one was just a copy that i had uh, on my phone and uh, i i did not expect this to happen so yeah Doctor Ravi, yeah. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, yeah. I think we have yeah. the technical issues made a bit of hassle right now. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think uh, we don't have much questions right now. Actually, but. Yeah. Uh, one of our uh, uh, participants had asked earlier about yeah. removal of the biofilm so how do you do it okay uh, removal of the biofilm it's see
that will also help in removing the biofilm. Whereas when you are using, uh, doing a cavity prep, um, you know, the, the, what is most important is that you're, you're removing the caries. So the biofilm as such is not so much of an issue when you are doing a um, cavity prep. Whereas it is important when you're doing a, a cross pipe, for sure. If you're doing an abrasion defect, definitely there is a biofilm on the tooth surface. So um, what you need to do is that just take some uh, pumice slurry, apply it onto the tooth, use a rubber cup and, uh, uh, you know, uh, remove it. So that's, that's, what is, that's what is needed. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, okay. I think I, I think the the participant was asking about some uh, uh, aluminium oxide which is being used to remove it. I I don't know what. Yeah. Uh, I... Yes, it is. It is. It is the same thing. This the sandblaster. Uh, yeah. As I said, either you can use a pumice slurry, or you can use an intraoral etcher. So the intraoral etcher essentially nothing but aluminium oxide particles which we are using under the air pressure. It is nothing but a um, sandblaster is connected to our chair unit with uh, high pressure and it removes the, uh, the the biofilm that is present on the tooth. So, you know, that's it, that, that's that's how it goes. Okay, sir, no, uh, actually, uh, whether the use of pumice or the sandblast, uh, is there any uh, change in the outcome of the restorative, restorative uh, the, the procedure? Uh, the well, okay, I don't know of any studies as such that will, uh, that, uh, you know, discuss the difference between the overall effect of using pumice or a sandblaster. Uh, but I would be more concerned about the possible uh, use a rubber dam yeah as much as possible if that's not possible just uh, cotton rolls and teflon packs to help get the best uh, dry feel that you can yeah okay sir i don't think yeah. we have more questions yeah uh, simon sir yeah a anybody wants to ask any questions can unmute and ask I think there aren't any questions. Uh, Dr. Ravi, can you conclude? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Matthew, sir, uh, yeah. actually uh, the, the class was very specific, uh, even though when uh, we had discussed